The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting, Inc., ESPN 1510, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The views expressed in this program are for informational purposes only and do not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Jason will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci along with Jason Lank in studio this morning. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, if you have questions on anything that we discuss on today's show, or if you would like more information about investing in ETFs, you can call an ETF store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFs. That's 877-365-3837. Or you can always visit us online at ETFstore.com. All right, great show for you this morning. We're going to start today by talking about stock market predictions. My guess is that you've probably seen or heard a lot more stock market predictions over the past month or so. Usually when the stock market starts bouncing around like we've seen recently, you'll see all of these uh, Nostradamuses of the investment world start to come out of the uh, out of the woodwork. Everyone wants to polish off their crystal ball and take a nice deep look into the future. But have you ever wondered just how accurate some of these predictions are? Should you even be paying attention to any of these predictions? Well, we have some thoughts on this today, along with a few interesting data points. We're going to take a pretty critical look at this business of making stock market predictions. Now, later in the show, we will have our usual weekly market update. We'll talk about the big move from U.S. stocks last week. And we'll also be joined by Joe Barato, CEO and Director of Investment Strategies at Arrow Investment Advisors. They oversee Arrow Shares, which is an up-and-coming ETF provider. And Joe's going to highlight the two Arrow Shares ETFs. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can find us on Twitter, or you can email us at advice at etfstore.com. Now, I, I think that most people, if you're like me, you probably enjoy hearing predictions. I think whether it's a prediction on who's going to win in an election or who might win the big game this weekend or what the stock market might do, I think predictions can be intriguing. I think it's interesting to hear what other people think might happen in the future. There's just something naturally alluring about that. You know, we're here in Kansas City. And so for our baseball fans listening, you know that the Kansas City Royals are in the World Series. And I enjoy baseball, and I'll be the first one to say that when the Royals clinched the American League pennant and all of the national baseball writers started coming out with their predictions on who would win the World Series, I looked at them. I found them to be entertaining. I wanted to see what some of the smartest minds following baseball had to say. But here's the thing. Even though these writers know more about baseball than probably most people. You know, they do, after all, cover baseball 24-7. At the end of the day, I think we all know that they don't know how these games are going to play out. That's why we watch the games. That's why the games are played. But what's interesting is that I found when it comes to the stock market, for whatever reason, some investors tend to put a lot more stock, uh, no pun intended there, Jason, uh, into the predictions of so-called market experts. That's why CNBC and, and Bloomberg and Fox Business are all on the air, people want to know what's going to happen next in the financial markets. It's just human nature to take an interest in predictions. We've all given them. We like to hear them. We tend to ignore the ones that don't come true and remember the ones that do. It's, it's a funny thing, but you're right in that stock market predictions, or really predictions about money, have a special place in most people's hearts. I'll give you an example. You know, if, if, Nate, if I were to predict uh, or attempt to predict snowfall around the Midwest, you know, I may be good at that, but that doesn't get your blood flowing, does it? You know, what will happen next winter? But if I stand on the mountaintop, and yell with the loudest of lungs that the market's going to double in five years, that'll make heads turn. And it's because we're talking about money. It's just different. People gravitate and want to hear, in some cases, what they want to hear. It's natural to want to know what the future holds. Now, that's easier said than done. Well, and I wanted to bring up this topic today because it's been pretty apparent to me that over the past month or so, as the stock market began teetering just a bit, 
I started to see a lot more predictions coming out. Uh, you know, you name the media outlet, and I can probably find a headline with a prediction of uh, some impending doom. And let me give you a few examples. I actually pulled some headlines that I came across just over the past month or so. Uh, now, Jason, don't panic when you hear these. Uh, these are just a tad bit frightening. Uh, listen to these. The first headline, this was from a piece on CNN.com on October 15th. Brace yourselves for another financial crash. Again, that was from CNN.com. Uh, on October 21st, here was a headline on CNBC. Icon, uh, as in Carl Icon, quite concerned that something is going to happen with the stock market. Let me say that again. Quite concerned that something is going to happen with the stock market. What exactly does something mean? That's an excellent question. Uh, and then how about this one? Back on September 25th, this was from uh, Market Watch. Is the stock market bubble of 2014 ready to burst? And I'm thinking to myself, for investors reading some of these headlines and stories, boy, this sounds pretty scary. Financial crash, stock market bubble. Carl Icahn is quite concerned. And these were just a few of the articles I had time to jot down. I really could go on and on here. There were headlines like this coming out uh, seemingly every day since late September. And it's not like these are coming from little podunk financial media outlets. They're not. Uh, you know, the CNBCs of the world, and that's just one source. These are large platforms. And the reason they have such a large reach is that they have a lot of viewers. You know, these are huge financial sources of information that many investors tend to use. So there is kind of a herd effect in that if we're all listening to the same doom and gloom or whatever the prediction may be, you know, that we all tend to react in a similar way. They absolutely impact investors. It's tough not to pay attention when you hear a similar headline in different places, that repetition aspect. Uh, it, it absolutely can color your thinking if you don't think critically. These, pro, these platforms, rather, tend to attract high-profile guests also, and they command your attention. They're charismatic. Well, yeah, and when you think about the types of guests and commentators on places like CNBC and Bloomberg, uh, these are some very high-profile very well-educated, smart individuals that are making these predictions. But here's the thing. That sort of background does not guarantee that their prediction is any better than yours or mine. If you recall, back in February, we actually did a show on the track record of so-called market experts. So these are the Jim Cramers of the world, uh, the Abby Joseph Cohens. Uh, and there's a research firm, CXO Advisory Group. They collected over 6,500 forecasts on the U.S. stock market from 68 of these so-called market experts from 1998 to 2012. So this was a comprehensive study to try to determine just how accurate these individuals were. And what they found was uh, was really astounding. Across the 6,500 forecasts, they found the combined accuracy rate of the 68 experts on these predictions was less than 47%. Less than 47%. That's astounding. Um, you know, just off the cuff, how can that be? You know, these are the experts, right? Um, you know, on one hand, this is disappointing. You know, just at first take, how can the thought leaders in this industry get it so wrong? You know, you know, you would think, boy, they're certainly right more than half the time, but 60, 70, 80 percent when they, you know, put their reputation on the line. Um if you're in an individual investor trying to make some predictions or do your homework, that's how do you how do you feel about that? You know, if these guys can't get it right, what chance do I have? Now, that's one hand. The other hand, this is actually liberating. If we recognize that much of what you hear, frankly, is noise rather than information, we can turn down the volume and we can take a sensible approach to things. The next time you hear uh, something interesting being being prognosticated about remember half the people saying that are wrong or 53 percent in other words but the, the as disappointing as that figure is it actually fits with some of the other data points nate that we see surrounding active management that's a great point because you've got experts making predictions about the future whether that be interest rates or stock market levels those sort of things and you have active managers making predictions about individual stocks trying to outperform the market as a whole. 
And we've had many shows where we've talked about the SPIVA report card and the, the track record of active management tends to be as disappointing as this recent study you're mentioning. Well, and the interesting thing here is really it's not just limited to the so-called market experts uh, or, or even the active mutual fund managers. Uh, I came across an article from Market Watch last week, and I tweeted this out. It highlighted a Bloomberg survey of 67 economists back in April. And they asked these economists whether interest rates would be higher or lower in six months. Now, get this. These are economists. Uh, remember, this is what they do for a living. 67 out of 67 economists predicted higher interest rates, which we all know means that 67 out of 67 economists were completely wrong. Rates have come down. It shakes your faith in experts, doesn't it? It's amazing. It, it, it really points out how hard it is to predict the future. You, know, you think of the weatherman. You know, they, they take a lot of guff for getting it right and getting it wrong. And you know, generally, over the next few days, they're going to get it more right than they don't. But ask them to predict something six months or a year in advance. You know, it's virtually impossible. I've, I've had, in our industry, I've had the, really the privilege of visiting with a number of economists to talk about issues, including a Nobel Prize winner. And either, tongue in cheek, I actually find it interesting that you could find 67 economists to give you a firm answer. <laughs> the, 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 the patent answer to any question you might ask starts with, well, on one hand, and that implies, you know, they're hedging their bets. So if you got 67 of them to give you a firm prediction and they're all wrong, wow, that stands out. But the other thing, too, here, again, this just highlights how difficult it is for anybody to make a prediction on, on where the future market's heading or, or interest rates or anything. You know, another point I would make here uh, with any of these market predictions, if I predict something long enough and it finally comes true at some point, does that still make me right? And I recall a few pretty well-educated investors predicting that uh, the market would collapse even further back in February and March of 2009. And even as the market continued to rise, they were still saying it was just a head fake, that we still had further to fall. Now, now remember, since March of 2009, we're up some 200% in the S&P 500. Uh, and there have been plenty of market experts who have continued to say stocks were going to fall all along the way. We've continued to talk about how the markets climbed this wall of worry. But, you know, my point here is even if they're ultimately right, let's say in 2015, the world comes to, the, to an end and the market drops 50 percent. Was that an accurate prediction? Was it worth it to you as an investor to have listened to whoever that person was making the prediction? Now, I know this may be somewhat of an extreme example, but let's think about if you had $50,000 in February or March of 2009 and invested it all in the S&P 500 index through the end of last week. That would have grown to be about $150,000. Now, let's say that the market does crater 50% in 2015. That would still leave you with $75,000. So was that worth it? Well, you know, I think that's for the individual investor to decide. But I would point out you would still be up $25,000 since 2009, even in that scenario. You see my point here, Jason? Well, you're right. It's one thing. There's really two issues. When you make a prediction, you need to get it right. But there's this issue of timing. When do you get it right? You know, you mentioned Nostradamus early on. You know, there are people that, that say he predicted World War II. Well, that's several hundred years later. And so did he get it right or did he get it wrong? I, I guess, you know, history will tell. But, but you're right. If we make a prediction, if I go on TV and I speak loudly and say this is going to happen, but it, it happens weeks, months, years later, was I right? Um, you know, I don't know. You know, and it begs the question – these people that you're on TV, how do they get on TV? How do they become experts? Were they invited to be on TV because of their prowess and historical record of accuracy? Are they paying to be on TV? It, you know, there's a lot of reasons you, you see who you see on TV, and a lot of them may be something you haven't considered. You know, we just need to think critically when you hear something compelling. And really, this leads me to kind of a perhaps a tongue in cheek discussion of how to become an expert. And if there's a playbook, if you're if you're interested in becoming a well-known prognosticator, there's three things. There's more than three, but there are three basic things. that If you get them right, you've got a good chance. The first quality that you're going to have to exhibit is certitude. If you're going to be an expert predictor, you must project absolute faith. When's the last time you saw someone predict something and say, eh, it may happen? No, 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 no. If you really want to impact people, you better speak. You have to get up with, there and beat the, beat the table. You, you better have conviction. There's no milk toast allowed here. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Studies from the psychology field show that the more 
the more the more certain a person appears, the more believable he seems to be. Now, so we want to be certain about what we're saying. The second thing you want to do is you want to be loud. You want to shout to the heavens on any platform you can find. Uh, we're not no whispering aloud here. You want to make sure your voice is heard. And by the way, if there's a critic that's that has a different viewpoint, uh, be sure to shout them down. Um, never let someone get the last word in either. There's another little tip. Always get the last word in as you're shouting. The third. So you want to be certain you want to say it loud. You want to say it often and you want to say it on every platform you can find. And actually, that's easier to do today than ever before with the Internet, you know, whether it's on radio TV, magazines, social media, two cans connected by twine. You want to get your message out that you're certain, that you're right, and that you're loud, and you do it on every platform uh, possible. So if you do all these things, even if you're completely wrong... What a great playbook. What, you, you, you may be perceived as an expert. Um, I'll give you two quotes on prediction. This, the, the first one's kind of funny. This goes back to the 20s, and if you're a student of history, you recall that during the 20s, before the Great Depression of uh, the market crash of 1929, there were many, many predictions. The market was skyrocketing. Everybody was making money from your shoe shine boy to the taxi cab driver. You got stock tips from everybody. And one of the most notable, if not infamous, figures of the 20s, the 20s was a gangster in Chicago named Al Capone. And the press actually went to Al and said, um, you know, what do you think about uh, what you're hearing? And it's funny, he said, you know, regarding the predictions in the stock market. Well, that's a racket. These stock market guys are crooked. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that may have been more true than prediction. Uh, who knows? But there's also someone more recent that's one of the best investors in history, a guy named Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha. And he said something pretty profound. He said, forecasts may tell you a great deal about the forecaster but they tell you nothing about the future. And so that's one of the richest men on the planet telling you what he thinks about predictions. Now, we just don't know the motivation of those giving predictions. The term we use in the financial services industry is talking your book. And I think this is an important point. I want to delve into this because when you hear whoever it is you're listening to saying the market's going up or the market's going down, you need to understand that that person is employed and most probably has some sort of position or take on the market. You know, they will most probably win if the, if the prediction they say comes true and lose if the prediction they say doesn't come true. You know, when's the last time you saw a stock market expert whose interests lie in the stock market going up tell you the stock market's crashing? When is the last time you heard a bond manager, a fixed income manager, say, we're going to heck in the handbasket, sell everything you own. You just don't hear it. You know, they're rarely going to say something, whether they believe it or not, that's terribly inconsistent with what they do. Yeah, you just don't know the motivations behind some of these predictions in the stock market, which makes it all the more reason to take these with a grain of salt. We already know that, that nobody can sit here today and predict the future. Now you add to that perhaps some financial incentive for somebody to, to make a prediction one way or another, and that really compounds the issue. You know, it's also interesting to me that, you know, Jason, if you get one of these market calls right, you're a hero. Uh, and everybody seems to forget about all of your bad market calls. Uh, I think back to some of these individuals who call the housing bubble correctly, uh, guys like hedge fund manager John Paulson or economist Noriel Rubini. But if you look at their investment or prediction track record since then, it's not necessarily a thing of beauty. Uh, and that's not to say that these guys aren't smart. But to me, it's really a numbers game. You have thousands and thousands of market followers making predictions. Someone is always going to be right regardless of what happens. You know, there are smart people right now who will tell you the situation in the Middle East will escalate and become a bigger conflict and stocks will crater uh, or that at some point in the future, the U.S. will be bankrupt because of the growing debt burden. And of course, stocks will crater uh, or that we're already in another housing bubble. Uh, you, you get my point here, but somebody is always going to be right. I just think your chances of finding that person and then having them be correct on their timing and the magnitude of whatever the event is, it's just extremely difficult and, and really unlikely. It's a tall order. We, we just have to think critically about the context of whatever prediction you're hearing, who's saying it, what they, why they may be saying it, where they're saying it. So think critically. Um, you understand, you're right, Nate, if you get enough people together, somebody's going to be right. You know, is that the guy you're listening to? I, you know, I don't know. What do you do in the in the, with this information when you realize that 
you know, it's not a whole lot different than flipping a coin. I think it comes back to having a plan. You know, your plan now that you know the majority of of, of predictive you know predictions out there are, are are no better than a coin flip. You need to stand, have a firm footing of what you believe in and what you're going to do over the long haul. Since there is you know a fifty percent chance of them being wrong. You just have to do your own work and not rely on that. And, and I'll say this, Nate, you know, at the ETF store, we're not in the prediction business. You know, we have to remind ourselves that humility is the probably the best quality you can have. And you just you have to accept the fact that it really plan accordingly, that events will most likely vary wildly from your predictions. So to have a chance to succeed, you have to be very humble and understand that. Well, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the segment, Jason, you know, look, I think everybody finds predictions entertaining. I, I certainly do. And I would also say that you can even learn something every once in a while from these predictions. But, you know, the key is whether or not these predictions are actionable, whether or not you, you, you take some sort of action in your portfolio based on them. And I think if you look at the track record uh, that, that we've seen in the market, some of the data we cover today, you know, it's pretty clear that that's a tough proposition if you're going to take actionable investment uh, ideas in your portfolio based on some of these stock market predictions. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll have our weekly market update. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. Hi, this is David Van Oy of the Van Oy Group at Reese and Nichols Realtors. Thanks for listening to my friends at the ETF Store. When making decisions about buying or selling a home, you need first someone who is knowledgeable and someone you can trust. With nine years of experience and over $40 million at residential sales, I would love an opportunity to apply for that job. If you would like more information on a specific home or a property evaluation in Missouri, call 536-SOLD. In Kansas, call 259-HOME. Or go to our website, thevanoygroup.com. Want a more beautiful, livable home? Talk to Schlegel Design Remodel. No one offers more ways to add value to your home while saving you money. I'm Jake Schlegel. We have services for every need, like our popular one-week bath and express custom kitchen remodels, completed in a lot less time for a lot less money. We also offer professional handyman services for chores around your home. Whatever your needs, call Schlegel Design Remodel, 816-361-9669, or go to remodelagain.com today. When refinancing a mortgage, all of the numbers can become confusing. With First Mortgage Solutions, you only need to remember two, 500, and zero. $500 is the amount our average customer saves every month after refinancing. And zero is the number of loans we've ever done that have ended up in default. At First Mortgage Solutions, business is based on dollars and cents. Saving you dollars with loans that make sense. For more information, call 816-778-7000 or apply online at firstmortgagekc.com. NMLS number 244476. There's a revolution occurring in the investment world. Exchange-traded funds, which have been called the next generation mutual funds, can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and increase your investment options. This is Nate Geraci with the ETF Store, an investment advisor located right here in Kansas City. Call us toll-free at 877 877- 365-3837 or visit us online at etfstore.com. And don't forget to tune in to the ETF Store Show every Tuesday at 9 a.m. right here on ESPN 1510. For those of you who haven't heard, the oldest building in Kansas City has the newest rooftop deck. Kelly's Westport Inn's rooftop deck has a full-service bar, TVs, bathrooms, lots of fans, and an awesome view of Westport. Kelly's has a weekday happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 to 7. They also have live music every Friday and Saturday night. Come enjoy tunes from bands like Lost Wax, Flanagan's Right Hook, and Michael Beer's Band. Every city has a place where the elite gather for witty conversation over trendy cocktails. In Kansas City, that place is definitely not Kelly's. For more information, go to kellyswestportin.com. Typical estate planning is transactional, focused solely on money, offering cookie-cutter documents, resulting in plans that do not address what is truly important to you and your loved ones. Bridge Builder's unique planning process focuses on the three dimensions of family wealth. Financial, what you own. Human, who you are. And intellectual, what you know. Bridge Builder, plans for life. Architects at protecting and perpetuating family wealth for generations. Please contact Bridge Builder for a free consultation at 913-956-3984. Tired of running around town trying to find the best products for your business? Regal Distributing can help. With over 9,000 stock products in categories like food service packaging, professional facilities, office supplies, and sustainable janitorial solutions, you'll be sure to find what you need at Regal. Visit us on the web at GetRegal.com or call locally at 913-894-8787. And don't forget to check out Regal's state-of-the-art showroom and training center located off 435 and K-10 Highway. Go with the local partner you can trust. 
Go with Regal. Distributing service and solutions since 1955. Back to the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. A huge week for U.S. stocks last week. Let's talk about it in our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. So as I mentioned, U.S. stocks did lead the way last week. The Spider S&P 500 ETF was up well over 4%. It's best week in nearly two years. International stocks also fared well. The Vanguard Developed Markets ETF was up nearly 3%, and the Schwab Emerging Markets Equity ETF was up over a half of a percent for the week. Looking at bonds, the iShare 7 to 10-year Treasury Bond ETF was down about a half of a percent. And then finally, the iShares Gold Trust was also down about a half of a percent. The Rogers International Commodity ETN was flat, and the Vanguard REIT ETF was up over 3% for the week. You know, it's interesting to me, and we were just talking about this earlier in the show, but over the past month or so, we have seen all of these uh, negative Nellies come out of the woodwork on the market. So I think there's been a constant flow of negative headlines about how we have a, a stock market bubble popping. And we've even seen some of these bearish prognosticators uh, really already doing victory laps. And of course, almost on cue, the S&P 500 had not only its best week of 2014, but it's best week since January of 2013. In other words, U.S. stocks just had their best week in nearly two years. And, you know, Connor and I talked about this last week, but we said the key thing to keep an eye on here is corporate earnings, that you wanted to tune out all of the negative headlines on, on Europe and, and Ebola and ISIS and focus on earnings. Earnings were going to tell the story. And last week, earnings overall continue to come in better than expected. And so, Jason, we did see the markets react positively to that. It's it's actually refreshing to see, get back to a little bit of fundamental analysis. I mean, you'd like to think in a normal world, when a corporation is more profitable next year than this year, well, stock probably should go up. And, and the reverse holds true as well. We've been in an environment where the predictions are coming out of the woodwork. We've been just consumed with international events, the Ebola crisis and you know, Ukraine and on and on and yeah, on. The news wire has moved the market. Absolutely. And, you know, we all we, we know that we live in a 24 hour news cycle, if not shorter with the Internet and Twitter. We may be in a 10 minute news cycle at this point. But it's, it's a, it is a reminder that your investment plan has to extend beyond that that business cycle or rather the news cycle and, you know, keep your eye on the ball. And, you know, on this subject of predictions, we, we had a little fun in the first segment about the, the lack of reliability. You know, we just had one of the best weeks in the last couple of years, but you could stack that one up in the last decade or so. It's in the top 10. How many experts were out there predicting that this would happen a month ago? Well, I can't. I, I wasn't. You weren't. I didn't read about any. So the, it's interesting to, to think about not only the predictions that were made and were wrong, but think about all the predictions that were never made. Aren't these experts supposed to foresee this stuff? Well, apparently not. Well, you know, the other thing, too, I think a lot of the headlines have driven some of these predictions. We're talking about things like Europe and Ebola and ISIS, but they've also driven volatility in the markets. Uh, you know, I think it's re important to remember that volatility, though, isn't just big moves down. Volatility shouldn't just be perceived as a negative. Volatility can also mean big swings up, and that's what we saw last week. And if you look out over the last three weeks in the stock market, the S&P 500 was down over 3%, down over 1%, and then up over 4%. That's volatility. Yeah, we have to step back and understand what volatility is and how to use it to your advantage. Now, you're right in that folks don't, my phone, my phone doesn't tend to ring as much when the market's gapping up as when it gaps down. But from a volatility standpoint, that's volatility. So to understand why stocks are more volatile than bonds and why bonds are more volatile than cash, it's called the risk premium. There's a reason why stocks tend to outperform other instruments because there's an element of volatility. They can go up and down. So the price we pay for the long-term outperformance of equities over bonds, is that volatility. Now, it's okay to have volatility. Let's talk about volatility up. 
phone isn't ringing as much. But that is a time to take notice when things are moving up. Perhaps that's an opportunity to rebalance. That volatility has given you a signal that maybe we need to sell some of our losers or rather sell some of our of our instruments that have outperformed, invest in things that have underperformed, perhaps your dollar cost averaging in, that sort of thing. Well, what happens if the market goes down in a volatility standpoint? Well, are there some action items there? How do we take advantage of that? Well, remember, we're in the stock market. Buy low, sell high. Doesn't feel good, but that's when astute investors take advantage of that. So volatility isn't something to be shunned and close your eyes and turn your head. It's something to be mindful of and use to your advantage. Well, it gets back into having a disciplined plan in place. And briefly here, and I think this is somewhat related to this discussion on volatility in the markets, there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday titled Bad Stock Market Timing Fueled Wealth Disparity. It was written by Josh Zumbrun. And the article referenced research from the Fed as well as the University of Michigan. And what they found was that millions of Americans have made the mistake of selling stocks at the worst possible times. And their point was that this has had a real effect on the widening wealth inequality in this country. And I don't want to get into a discussion on wealth inequality. I think there are a lot of different facets to that particular discussion. But listen to the simple example they gave in the article. And this was very similar to the example I gave earlier in the show. They said, imagine two well-off households each with $100,000 in the stock market in 2007. A family that sold in 2009 after losing half its portfolio value may now have $50,000 in a savings account. A family that held on would now have about $130,000 in stocks. Uh, And again, their point was that this wealth inequality uh, has grown, at least in some part, because of these poor investment decisions. It's it's troubling to hear. You know, that's a a perfect example of seeing volatility and not using it to your advantage, but actually letting it take advantage of you. And and that is unfortunate. You know, I you know, Nate, I've got a big place in my heart for the working men, the middle class, you know, that's who we're talking about here. And, you know, to the on that point, I think our industry can do a much better job of helping people understand you know, how to use volatility, what it actually means, and if you have a reasonable timetable and a reasonable plan you don't have to be afraid of those things and make decisions under duress. And that's what we've seen. Yeah, and that's the key here. I think with, with what we've covered so far on the show today, you know, just be very careful overreacting to, you know, whether it's stock market predictions that you hear or, or volatility that you see in the market. Again, you want to keep uh, your eyes on the prize, so to speak, take a longer term approach uh, and, and not let these sort of things drive your investment decisions. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, Joe Barato, CEO and Director of Investment Strategies at Arrow Investment Advisors, will join us to spotlight two Arrow Shares ETFs. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. There's never a bad time to see your dentist. So if you haven't been for a while or if one of your teeth is actually starting to hurt, it's always easier to fix it before it gets worse. We aren't anti-dentides like the Seinfeld episode. So give Dr. Kevin or Matt Cummings a call at 816-246-1003 or check us out on our website, www.cummingsdentistry.com. Remember, floss the ones you want to keep and mention this ad and get a 10% discount on your first visit. Will you profit from rising food prices? Bulk Food International. Do you want a tangible asset besides gold or silver? Bulk Food International. Would you like to own an investment that will be valuable 10, 20, 30 years from now? Bulk Food International. With Bulk Food International, you can own a variety of food products that will be viable and valuable for years to come. Bulk Food International will store your products for you or deliver to your location. Best of all, you can use your IRA or 401k funds to make your purchase. Bulk Food International. 816-888-8290. Investing in your future. If you, a family member, or maybe someone you know have been the victim of someone else's negligence, whether due to a motor vehicle collision, an accident at work, a slip and fall, or a product defect, you may be entitled to compensation under the law. The law firm of Van Zanten and Onick is exclusively dedicated to representing victims of negligence in Kansas and Missouri. Please call 816-479-0404 today for a free consultation. Again, 816-479-0404. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements. It's a fact that most any day can be a special day for someone. A birthday, an engagement, an anniversary, a promotion, or an I love you day. It's also a fact that Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry offers hundreds of ways to say love or thanks or congrats or I'm so happy you're in my life. 
So when you want to make your special day extra special, think Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry, 131st and State Line, 816-941-2221. You want more exposure locally and nationally for you or your company? If you want to build your brand and reach more potential customers, then you need J Girl Media. J Girl Media is a full-scale consulting firm that can help you with all your media relations, PR, and public affairs efforts. J Girl Media can also help your business with any marketing, mobile app development, digital media, SEO, or content marketing needs. Grow your brand in an affordable way. Check out jgrowmedia.com today. Do stains in your carpet keep coming back and now you're stressing over the high cost to replace it? Then you need to call Zero Res. Their carpet cleaning process does not use soaps or toxic chemicals, which all leave behind residues that attract more dirt immediately. This Zero Residue technology will not only have your carpets looking great, it also extends the life of your carpet. Check them out online at ZeroResKC.com or call 816-425-3655 and schedule your cleaning today. Has it been a while since you or your financial advisor reviewed the investments in your portfolio? With today's ever-changing global economy, it's become more critical than ever to make sure your portfolio is on track. Whether you're managing your own investments or using an advisor, it never hurts to get a second opinion. At the ETF store, we provide free consultations on your portfolio. We'll highlight the strengths and weaknesses and tell you exactly what you're paying for your investments. This is absolutely free. There's no obligation. Just give us a call at 816-363-3837 or click on the free consultation button at etfstore.com. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. Let's go right to our weekly ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF Store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,600 ETFs available to invest in. The ETF store sorts through them all so you don't have to. We're actually going to spotlight a pair of ETFs today, both of which are from ETF provider AeroShares. And joining us now via phone from Maryland to discuss these ETFs is Joe Barato, CEO and Director of Investment Strategies at Aero Investment Advisors. Joe, thanks for joining us this morning. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, Joe, before we get into these two ETFs, I know that some of our listeners may not be familiar with AeroShares. Uh, can you tell us just a little bit about AeroShares, the ETF provider, and maybe also a little bit about your background? Sure, sure. Uh, well, I'll start, you know, I um, spent about 11 years after graduating from college working for the Federal Reserve, and then I um, got to work under Alan Greenspan's, uh, with Alan's Green, among Alan Greenspan's team when I was there, and uh then I went to move to a company called Rydex Investments, and Rydex was uh, known for having leveraged uh, inverse and mutual funds. And uh, while I was there, I uh, worked on the product development team and helped them get into the ETF space and helped um, launch um, some unique products out there, RSP and Equal Weight S&P 500, uh, which was sort of a what I would feel a revolutionary product in the marketplace when it came out. And then in 2006, uh, you know, followed my, the American dream and started uh, my own investment company with uh, some folks that I used to work with over at, at Ridex. And uh, we launched, uh, uh, we have now have five funds and two exchange traded products, and we're gearing up to have uh, multiple ETFs launched over the next uh, over the next year, utilizing the different relief that we have to get products out in the marketplace. Well, let's talk about your flagship ETF, the Aero Dow Jones Global Yield ETF, ticker symbol GYLD. This is what we would call a, a multi-asset class ETF, and the focus here is on generating yield. Uh, tell us how it works. Sure. So, um, you know, we, we took some of the concepts that we really liked when we were um, building products at Ridex, and, and one of them is equally weighting. And, you know, we in the early stages of our company, we also helped Alarian uh, launch their AMLP product. And we, we saw the unique desire in the marketplace to have exposure to um, yield. And But there's some impacts and efficiencies with just buying an MLP direct. So we wanted to build a product that was – as you said earlier, global in nature, and provide exposure to global sovereign debt, 
uh, global corporate debt, global alternatives, which would be the MLPs, equity-based, global real estate, and global equity, each having 50 securities in each of the baskets. Everything's equally weighted uh, with a focus in each of those baskets delivering yield, and it's a global nature looking for yield in, in a global structure. 60% equities, 40% bonds. So it's truly a very unique structure utilizing what we believe is a very unique way to allocate equally weighting across all areas that kind of lowers your volatility. Uh, it gives the investor, uh, we target it between 6 and 8% yield. Obviously, the yield can change based on the price of the instrument. Over the last 12 months, it's been delivering about a 6.5% yield. Joe, can you explain the process for selecting the individual securities? Uh, for example, if we take global equities, how are those individual securities selected? It's a good question. So we wanted to make sure there was no overlap in each of those buckets. So we have global real estate already, and we have what we call global alternatives, which is NLP-focused. So global equities will have no real estate or energy focus. that will look strictly at the financial services and utilities and other industries, uh, you know, healthcare, technology. Where, and it's looking primarily at the yield as the focus. It's looking at consistency of, uh, of the yield that's been being generated among that universe. We work very closely with Dow Jones on the equity side. That similar process was applied to the real estate securities that were selected in that basket and the MLP basket as well. On the sovereign debt, we work with Credit Suisse, and we uh, work with their uh, screening process, and each of these buckets that we're talking about is its own index and has its own index methodology. So um, where, where there's no individual selection going on by anybody on our portfolio team, we're following a defined methodology, and we work very closely with the index provider to develop a process that was looking for consistency of yield, uh, things that, you know, every investor should be, you know, concerned about. But obviously, uh, we're relying on the skill sets of uh, the index providers that we work with when we define that methodology. Joe, this is Jason Lang sitting alongside Nate in studio. I wanted to ask you a question about currencies. This is a global ETF, and that brings to mind what happens if the various currencies move, the dollar, the yen, the euro, so on and so forth. Is there any consideration for that? Is anything hedged? What, what's your take on that? Well, uh, it's a good question, and and we were we 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 thought of it like this when we were looking at our global exposure. Um, everything was dollar denominated, um, so we, we we immediately take away that currency risk uh, that we I think you're you're implying could happen in some international products. Um, although we do have exposures, um, it, it, right now the portfolio has roughly 43% exposure to U.S. instruments. 20% of that's in corporates, and 17s in the alternatives. The rest is spread out globally, but they're dollar-denominated instruments traded on European exchanges or even the Asian exchanges. So we, we the exposure that you would think from a uh, a fall, let's say, in the global markets uh, in or or individual country is somewhat reduced, um, and we wanted that exposure um, to. We wanted that type of structure to not have to worry about those kind of global shocks that you would be concerned about. Joe, where might an ETF like this fit in an investor's portfolio? Is this really an income play, a growth in income? It's a good question. I, I personally um, I put this uh, in a uh, in the category of like it moves like an equity because it has a lot of the equity volatility, but it's delivering a yield. You know, the S and P five hundred is delivering a two percent yield, um, and and we are delivering you know something really higher with about the same amount of volatility as the S and P. So I would encourage investors to look at this as some type of uh, way to enhance your your equity basket um, if you're. Looking Looking for more yield, uh, and and some investors will take this uh, and will hedge out some of that market risk and try to blend it to create a bond-like strategy. Uh, obviously, that's more sophisticated. They probably need to work with advisors to be able to do things like that. But we 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 know and we're seeing advisors doing that today. There's a number of ways to incorporate it, but I think the key for an investor is to understand that it has volatility-like uh, risk. And a good example is even in the last 44 days, that while the strategy is down about nine. percent percent. Uh, it's still up o- over the course of the year. When we've seen these type of gyrations in the past, uh, we've seen significant outperformance over the next you know, 300 days, uh, especially over the equity markets. So it's just something for investors to think about. It's not only just a yield play. The basket that we've built will have capital appreciation built into it as well. Joe, when you talk about yield, I know GYLD is currently yielding close to 6%. 
I think one of the biggest challenges in investing right now is balancing the the risk reward equation when it comes to pursuing yield, especially with fixed income. How do you think investors should be thinking about this right now, and how does something like GYLD approach this balancing act? You know, I I would look at it the way I said earlier. An investor has tools out there today, more tools than they've ever had. I mean, you said it's 1,600 ETFs. There's alternative ETFs that are out there, uh, and I would encourage investors to blend um, maybe an alternative strategy with a product like ours. Uh, and, and you have to look at products not on an individual basis, but how they fit in the overall portfolio. It's it's really targeting what your risk objective is. So if you're looking for a way to enhance yields, there's even ways to blend this with bonds, lower your duration of your bond portfolio, and increase your yield, uh, and, and, and overall lower your overall risk, believe it or not. So there, there are many ways to blend this. It doesn't have to be that sophisticated. It could be as simple as just allocating with some additional bonds that you have in your portfolio, which we know are delivering much lower yields than, than they have had uh, historically. Joe, um, you know, in the yield-starved world we live in, um, at least in my for my client base, many of my retired clients and soon to be are looking for predictable income. And I noticed this particular ETF has a monthly distribution, and not all do. Was that was that by design? Yes, it was by design. Uh, and, and you know, the only thing that I would say about our monthly distribution is that um, MLPs uh, and some of the instruments that we have, they they don't pay consistently. Some of them pay quarterly, so we'll have some gyrations in our uh, in our distributions. There's some seasonality built into it, but it's been pretty consistent uh, with, with uh, the delivery. But you'll notice on quarters like November or months like November, August, May, and February, those distributions are significantly higher, and that's been pretty consistent since we launched the product out and historically consistent with what the design of the index was. But yes, it was designed to provide that income to investors and a lot of our advisors that are using it and investors that are using it like that feature. We're visiting with Joe Barato, CEO and Director of Investment Strategies at Arrow Investment Advisors. They offer the Arrow Shares ETFs. Joe, let's talk about your other ETF. This was just recently launched. It's the Arrow DWA Tactical ETF, ticker DWAT. This is an actively managed ETF. Uh, tell us a little bit about how it works. Well, it's um, we, we work with Dorsey Wright and Associates, who's notor- known for their uh, their their leadership on the technical analysis side. Uh, their relative strength, uh, relative strength is also known as a momentum tool. Uh, and what it has, it has uh, three buckets. It has an equity bucket, a fixed income bucket, and alternative buckets. And with each of those buckets, there are multiple uh, strategies, like U.S. Uh, sector rotation would be maybe in the equity bucket. There's a global income strategy in the fixed income, and on the alternative side, there's a commodity rotation strategy. And what we do is uh, we work with Dorsey Wright in identifying um, the strongest global macro strategies among the you know the ten that we have in the fund today. We rank those. Um, using a proprietary relative strength model, and then we buy the positions of the highest-ranking strategies in the portfolio, and it, it's constantly monitored, uh, and it's, it, has a, it uses a very strict uh, systematic uh, buy-and-sell discipline. Uh, it, it can allocate uh, strictly among ETFs, uh, and today the, the, the fund is holding um, about 13 ETFs in its portfolio tied to the underlying investment strategy that you know could be uh, among uh, the 10 that the, the fund can invest in. Can you talk a little bit about the concept of, of relative strength for our listeners who may not be familiar with that? Sure, sure. So um, we created a piece. I'd welcome people to go visit aerofunds.com and look at our educational section that talks about building a winning team. And uh, since your uh, your your folks in your your listening area potentially are Royals fans and and maybe some San Francisco Giants fans, uh, since baseball is a good theme in right these days, and I know it's an important game tonight in your local area, we we created a piece that really talks about relative strength as a measure of price trends. It's basically like think of it as a winning percentage like in baseball, uh, and it indicates how a security, or you can think of like winning percentage, like a team is performing relative to the other securities, or you could say other teams in that category. So in baseball, we look at winning percentage consistently over time, and we've identified that baseball teams that have consistently had a winning percentage over time, they tend to be those teams that rise to the top and potentially be in the playoffs year after year. Uh, a good example of that are like the Boston Red Sox and uh, New York Yankees, you know, and I know that's not happy happiness to maybe the Royal fans, but, <laughs> yeah. 
but but to some extent that that trend for relative strength is the same thing or you can also think of it like the final four right you have the final four where there's 64 teams and ultimately they go through it's the team that's got that uh it's, it's got the trend the momentum that's kind of getting them all the way to the final four and it may not be the team that you think you may not be the team that you think is the team that needs to be that should be there but it's the team that had has the strongest trend going into that maybe that tournament or as they're in that tournament so essentially I like to think of relative strength as, you know, as looking for the winners, constantly looking for the winners. And there's been a lot of academic research that supports the consistency, you know, momentum, relative strength is, is a, uh, investment, uh, factor that does work historically over time. It's been tested back to the Victorian age. It's been tested, you know, you know, throughout this, this century and the last century, uh, as being one of those factors that works. Charles Dow was probably the inventor of that, uh, when he, he, he actually created the Dow Jones Index. There, there's uh, a lot of belief that he was in, in, in a, a technical uh, analysis guru. Great baseball analogy, and uh, hopefully the Royals will show some relative strength over the next two games. <laughs> yeah. uh, Joe, I know that this ETF can also invest up to 30% in inverse U.S. equity uh, exposure in the event of a prolonged market downturn. Can you talk just a little bit about that? Sure. So we've um we have a, a mutual fund very similar to this ETF um and, and in that mutual fund we we all buy uh inverse securities uh to to get that exposure the ETF is a little different we we're using um we're using strictly ETFs to get that exposure um and, and we will buy an inverse product like ProShares um, has inverse ETF products tied to like the S and P 500. So in the event that there's, um, in the event that the relative strength indicates there's weakness in the overall equity markets, it has the ability to put the brakes on. And it's very similar to what a hedge fund will do. Global macro is very much, you know, while it's called the DWA tactical fund, it's got a global macro mandate. And global macro is a is a hedge fund strategy. Uh, and, and the hedge fund strategies allowed them to put the brakes on and actually accelerate in certain areas where, where they see strength in the marketplace. And we're just using the relative strength as the driver for that. So if there's no strength or, or there's weakness in the marketplace, it has the ability to put the brakes on in extreme situations. Joe, um, this particular ETF, rather than focusing on specific positions, individual stocks and bonds, you take a broad-based approach in those positions. How does that help the investor? That's a good question. I mean, I, look, I, I, I've been over the years. I've developed my own momentum models. Um, what, what I really like about this strategy, uh, and we have a balanced fund that's very similar to this, is that um, you've got you've got some symmetry because you've got a you've got an international rotation strategy or a sector rotation strategy, and we're. One of our funds that we have today will have balance among all of those things. This is going to look at each of those strategies individually and see how strong they are to one another. And there may be a scenario where the global rotation strategy is much stronger than what's going on in the U.S. sector rotation strategy. I know that was the case three or four years ago, and we know um, we know recently that the U.S. has been very strong relative to the international markets. So what I like about this is that this has the ability to really go anywhere and, and put that exposure in there. And with that, you know, you, you have to have some discipline to be able to get in and out. And I think that's, you know, this mutual fund that has been out and now the ETF, uh, we've been doing it in the mutual fund for over five years. So uh, and the ETF will, is really just a, a variation of that and now a new structure that anybody can utilize. Joe, is there any concern about whipsaw? I think one of the concerns some investors may have with a relative strength model is that in volatile markets, they might be kicked in and out of positions. Is that a concern here? You know, I think I, I, I do believe in any momentum model that there can be whipsaws. What I can also say is that the most important factor uh, for a relative strength to work is dispersion in the marketplace. So a great example is in 2008 when everything was down, all the correlations rise, right? So everything everything bounced from that bottom and there was no dispersion. When I mean by dispersion, I mean there's a separation from the winners and the losers. If everything bounces off the bottom evenly, you don't have that dispersion. So that's when you have scenarios where relative strength may not be, the signal may not be as strong. The good news for the investors is that the, the correlations to the marketplace has been dropping very steadily over the last few years, and that, is, that creates an environment where relative strength models will start to t- take off or, or start to have the ability 
rallied at alpha over like a, a pure equity instrument like the S&P 500. When everything bounces off the bottom, it's better to just be in a pure index that's giving you exposure to the equity markets. But when you've got dispersion coming into the marketplace, this is where this is where stock picking, or in this case, relative strength tools are utilized to kind of identify those winners. And, and we think that we've got a you know a very interesting strategy that can do that. Well, Joe, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, Certainly two very interesting ETFs. We greatly appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, and good luck luck tonight with the Royals. Thank you. That was Joe Barato, CEO and Director of Investment Strategies at Arrow Investment Advisors. And you can learn more about the AeroShares ETFs by visiting AeroShares.com. Jason, two pretty interesting ETFs. They were pretty interesting. Yeah, I would I would start off by saying there are some guts to these things. These are not simple tools. There are there are nuances. Uh, back to GYLD, you know, we live in a world that's that a very low interest rate. So when you start talking about a product with you know five six percent yield, that's attractive. He made another great point though. The, the, the relationship between the performance of this to the S and P isn't one to one. So there will be a little. There could be some hedging there. And again, you can learn more about both of those ETFs at AeroShares.com. We will have to leave it there as we are out of time for today's show. Thank you for joining us this morning. And be sure to join us next Tuesday at 9 a.m. as we'll have head of research at one of the world's largest ETF providers, Dave Mazza from State Street, will join us to talk spider ETFs and also offer some thoughts on the financial markets. Until then, have a great week, everyone.